<laughs> All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name, like always, hasn't changed. It's Josh Corporal, and we are streaming live from Key West, Florida. I have very, very special guest, Scott Mason, on the show. Scott, welcome to Fire Builders Live, man. Welcome. It is so good to be here. It is. It's so good. We, uh, uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while, ever since we first spoke, and I cannot wait to get into this. But before we do, let me tell everybody listening and watching at home what it is that we are doing here on Fire Builders Live. If this is the first time that you have seen this show, what we do is we bring on experts like Scott and we take these big ideas and these big goals and these big dreams that you've got and we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every single day to achieve, to achieve great things because it's these small consistent steps that really make a difference. Uh, and today is no different, right? In fact, today I am super excited to have Scott on the show. Listen to his rap sheet, right? Columbia Law School graduate, prestigious Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program graduate, right? But the guy doesn't stop there. You know, rather than saying, oh, how long is it going to take me to achieve this goal? No, no, no. He's like, yo, how far can I take this in life? Drawing over 30 years of executive experience, including being the general counsel, uh, everything from government agencies to nonprofits. He has his own successful business, which is the screen, the screen printing biz business called Brooklyn Press, which we will get into uh, later in the show because that is just awesome in itself. Uh, Scott is very familiar that everybody out there that has their own business and is working up towards something greater than themselves wants three things, right? To grow, to scale, and to sustain. But in order to make that happen, you got to kind of look at yourself and look at what's drawing you out, you know, what's pulling you in a particular direction, something that transcends the, the you know, the minutia of the day or the things that happen in the week. It's got to be a higher purpose that simultaneously has utility in the world. And that, my friends, is what we're going to be talking about today. So Scott, again, so awesome to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. And it is amazing how you were able to pack 30 years of experience into the life of someone that's only 23. I appreciate you doing that. <laughs> Incredible, dude. It's defying physics around here. I uh, I know, seriously, man, I, uh, I know you got, I mean, how many, you have, you have how many shows now? I can't even keep track. <laughs> I only have two. I just try and keep myself omnipresent. You know, you can't be the only one that's everywhere out there doing cool stuff. <laughs> Some of us have to give you a little bit of competition. Come on. I tell you, well, you definitely have a better setup than I do. That's for sure. Oh, uh, I don't know. That's pretty dope what you got there, man. The, the porch. Yeah, well, I will make sure that I tell Brian that. Uh, so, so I'll tell you... Um, this is so good to have you here. I like to start off our conversations by, uh, by, by asking you, where are you in the world right now? Like, where are you living these days? I am living in New York City, near Central Park in Manhattan. It is an area that for a while earlier this year kind of had a, that Walking Dead feel. Now, I like watching Walking Dead. It wasn't that fun living it, but it is gradually, slowly, and consistently, as New York is wont to do, resurging. And so in a way, it's, it's beautiful being in a place and watching it come back when it was so close to being lifeless for so long. Were you somebody that ended up just really hunkering down and not venturing out at all? Or did you go out and, you know, take some pictures and see what it was like all desolate, walking dead like? Yeah. If, you know, for the first couple of weeks, I really only did go out for grocery store um, trips or for walks at night. There was a time when I went out one Friday night. And I walked to the grocery store. I think it was 9, 10 at night. It was dark. And I lived near Broadway. Um, and like I said, in the middle of Manhattan and started to walk in the middle of the street up Broadway to the grocery store. <laughs> and I felt totally safe doing that since there were no cars, no taxis, no nothing. The only thing that came by was a bus that had one person sitting in it. That no was way. weird. 
That is weird. That's like that's straight up. What's that show? Uh, there's a movie with Will Smith where he's the last person on Earth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Another yeah. zombie movie. It was exactly like that. Yes. That's nuts. That's nuts. <laughs> and probably will never happen again unless you're on a movie set somewhere. That's that's crazy. Yeah. And let's hope it never does happen anywhere again. I am Legend. That was the name of the movie. So I when they do Legend. the remake and you and I are starring in it, that's when we'll see that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, it's funny because right at the beginning of uh, the lockdown here in Key West, same exact thing. I don't know if anybody, have you ever been actually to Key West? I can't remember. To my horror and shame, I have never set foot on that place. And I want to really bad. Well, so there is a famous street called Duval Street. It's the, you know, it's the main drag. It's where everybody is. And uh, right at the beginning of the shutdown, you could walk from one end of Duval Street to the other, all the way across, wow. right, right through the middle of the road. You know, there was no cars, nothing. It was just, it was surreal. Yeah, who would have ever thought we'd live through something like this? It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that uh, things are picking up and things are resurging in New York. Um, How, so first of all, I guess give everybody just a quick background, right? I touched on the general counsel, um, you know, graduating from Columbia. You were a lawyer for a number of years before you sort of ventured out. Tell me what, what happened there. Yeah. So I was a gradual transition, although there were parts where it was a little bit less gradual than others. I went to law school because I was interested in public policy and I got the job of my dreams. Actually, after I left um, law school working for the city of New York, I started out doing litigation for it, but quickly moved to work for a number of different government agencies where I worked on some amazing, amazing um, public policy and uh, and institutional reform related projects. But the fit was not always 100% there. And and part of why I transitioned into agency work was litigation really heightened heightened that. I have always enjoyed engaging in and being an actor in the excitement and the drama and the forward motion of the world. As as strictly in an attorney role, you were either facilitating the deals that made that forward motion in the world happen, or you were cleaning up in, lit- in a litigation context, the messes yep. that other people were making. So I was always a supporting actor. I was never part of the driving force. As I moved along in my career, I tried to position and successfully did that over and over to be more and more of that driving force. But the other challenge that I had with, um, being an attorney, and that is separate from other challenges that were associated with being part of large organizations. Uh, um, hello? There we go. We're back. Okay. You're back. You Great. said the other, other uh, challenges of being part of a large organization, and then I didn't hear oh, anything. We're maybe, maybe we're somewhat tied to this, but they weren't completely tied to it. And that is that, you know, you... ...leading edge of prog... Did I go out again? You did, just a little okay. bit. Just a little I don't bit. know what's going on with our with our internet. So thank you for your patience with me on that. No in worries. Or, in order to be part of making change, in order to be on the leading edge of what's happening in any in any sector, have to be willing to take risks. You have to be willing to be bold. You have to be willing to be out there, and you have to be in a position where you can project a vision outward. Working as an attorney, or in some sort of quasi legal fashion, always pulled you back from that. You were always looking for the reason to say no, or you were the person that was sort of saying, okay, let's slow down. That was an uneasy personality fit. And it was something that became um, exacerbated over time as I began to understand more and more who I was, what I was destined to be, and what that would mean. And over time between that and, and, and working for these large organizations, the pressure and the cognitive distance became unbearable. And, and so I changed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, I think that's a really, that's a really common thing for a lot of people, not just in the legal uh, space, but also just in life as they pursue things early on in their careers uh, and then realize and figure out that, that they're changing, that their feelings are changing about things. And 
Um, and so I think that a lot of people can really relate to that story, not necessarily as you know legal counsel or being part of public policy, but just discovering things about themselves as they grow and realizing, hey man, this wasn't quite as good of a fit as it once was. How do I reinvent myself? Yeah, yeah. And you know, the amazing paradox that comes with thinking about how to reinvent yourself is that for many people, including myself, the process of reinvention triggers fear. Because if you're going to reinvent your identity, you're shedding who and what you were before. Fear, in my opinion, is generally triggered by it, and I think appropriately, some sort of threat to our existence or to our physical or mental integrity. And so a transition, especially a major professional transition that is closely tied to our identity, triggers almost an, um, uh, an individual extinction level event type of fear. That being said, in order to, once you engage in that fear, once you take the steps you need to, to make that transition, the very thing that you're most afraid of actually occurs. Yet, it prepares you to face that over and over. In other words, it faces it by survive, by making it through conquering that fear, shedding that old identity, you're actually well positioned to be able to say, okay, I can handle something as existential of a threat as to who I am, as to my identity going forward. And that's why in a way over time, I've gotten more and more practiced at shifting who and what I'm willing to envision myself to be. And the world has opened up in a way I would have never dreamed imaginable because of that. And I would imagine too, as you continue to do that, your confidence level of being able to handle external situations is so much, so much higher because you essentially are deriving all of your power from within, all of that confidence from within. So it doesn't matter what happens if you, you know, you, you, you switch from being a lawyer to say like a, a, a screen printing, you know, shop, right? But you know that you can handle it because, because you yourself, you know, you're not afraid of failure anymore. Now all that confidence comes within, comes from within and the work itself doesn't define you. You have defined yourself. You know, government stereotypes aside, at the executive level, working for the city of New York under the administrations that I worked with, firing was, or dem humiliating demotions were often the um, the, the mode of choice to deal with problems. Do we want to coach the person? Do we want to offer them constructive suggestions? Do we want to maybe find a better place for them? Do we want to support them in being themselves? No, let's just fire. Too much work. <laughs> exactly. That's way too much work. You know, <laughs> and, just get rid of them. Exactly. And so one of the things that happened after many years of that with the administrations that I worked under was, in fact, there was one agency that I worked for where, uh, you know, so many people were getting fired every time you turned around that my assumption was, well, you know, it's just a matter of time before I get fired too. You know, it's like waiting in line to get on the roller coaster ride. Now, fortunately, that didn't happen to me. Um, but I, I, you know, got another job. So I didn't have to work in that sort of extreme under that sort of extreme fear. But that being said, you know, I almost got acclimated to the threat of job termination. So it was a constant fear. I went from government service into the nonprofit sector. And one of the things that the, that the CEO that I reported to noted about me was that I had an unreasonable fear of getting fired. He was like, you know, Scott, we're not gonna fire you here just because you accidentally, um, you know, said, um, during the middle of a sentence. Yeah. And, and so it took me a little while to get used to that. One of the beautiful things, that has happened around confidence and by taking these steps and by being willing to throw away that identity and that goes to exactly what you were just talking about is that you do understand even firing firing which is itself an existential threat. hey if you're working for yourself as i do you're not going to fire yourself but but let's say we're to go back into the job market it's an ex it is an existential threat in that it wipes your identity completely away but it is still something that's survivable and having gone through it and understanding that our identity can be cre can be created and us emerge even stronger from it would put me in the position and has put me in the position of a confidence beyond what I could have ever imagined. Now it really does take a lot for me to actually get afraid professionally. I perform 
to my highest level because I want to do that for my clients and that's who I am and that's what I want to put out in the world, not out of terror. I can't even imagine that anymore. And I think that it comes through. And I believe people sense it and they relate to it and they treat you accordingly, which is a yeah. big deal. Yeah, no, it is. It, and, you know, Perry and um, she kind of said this in two comments, but I'll try and put these up, right? I'm wondering if the demotion and the dismissal, right? were a way to keep the real problem under wraps, which is essentially like a managerial style, right? It's just like you said, it's way easier to do that than it is to try and and coax some greatness out of someone that you've hired. Totally. Not only that, I think it is easier. It requires and uh, it requires a lot less emotional risk um, and investment in the other human being and a lot less work. But the other thing, too, is I think in some sectors in government, <laughs> shockingly enough, tends to attract people like this. Um, for some people, power is an unbelievable attractor and a way of showing power. Unfortunately, I think it's a shallow, superficial and ultimately self-destructive show of power. But one way that people perceive shows of power is by having the ability to say you're fired. Um, again, I think that that's very superficial because if you're firing everyone, uh, eventually you don't have any, if in order to be a leader, you have to actually have followers. Right. <laughs> Every, everyone who is going to work for you, fire was, all of them. Yeah. You're going to be sitting there by yourself. Exactly right. You're leading an army of maybe your pet dog, if the dog sticks around. And <laughs> so, you know, but I think that played into it as well. Well, as you, as you, because we were talking about everybody out there sort of has this feeling about themselves. You know, they, they know that there's probably some type of elevated purpose that they were meant for out there, but very few actually pursue it. And yeah. I would imagine a lot of it is due to the fear that you just described, that fear of saying, look, if I don't have this job, who am I? Because essentially this job uh, defines who I am. I, I, yeah. I feel comfortable with that. And as soon as you leave that, then... Yeah then this sort of almost irrational fear of not knowing who you are shows up and it's really hard to, to focus on your purpose in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, what have you found? Well, actually, I might as well just segue into this because we're getting there anyway. And I'm, I'm, into the spring, pool. And I'm springing these on you because I actually uh, did not tell you about, there's only two questions that I ask people on this show. Oh, okay. So let's go. The first one is this because I know that you now work with a lot of people that you help them, you help them perform at their best, you know, figure out what it is in life that they were meant to do, but then also to make sure that whatever that thing is, it's not like ridiculously useless, you know, it's, it's actually providing something for the world in a utilitarian way. So as people go through that process, that transformation for themselves, in your experience, like what have you found? What's the first step to that in your, in your mind? I would suggest that each of us consider the following. And this is a step that I would say is a little bit more metaphysical or more of an intellectual exercise than purely a practical one. But I'm, I'm going to throw it out there because I'm actually an extremist about this. For us to really live a life that is hyper-fulfilled, hyper-engaged, in my opinion, that connection to purpose that you're talking about has to happen. And it may involve, like you just suggested, stepping out of the comfort zone, doing something that's afraid. And as we, I think it is reasonable for us to all say to ourselves, well, that's something people might need to prepare themselves for. And so the, the thing that I would suggest that people do is almost look at it from a moral or ethical perspective. I firmly believe, and I would challenge anyone in this audience or you to push back um, on me with this, that each of us are given two things in this life that are unique to us. Number one, our exact packages of gifts. Number two, our exact experiences. We're each given those two unique things that merge, mix, and become something that is unique to us. Those things were given to us for a reason. Do we fully actualize that reason? 
or do we hide it in the closet? If we're hiding it in the closet, if we are not fully unwrapping the gifts that providence, the universe, however you define it, gave it to you, my argument to you or to anyone listening is that you're actually committing a moral providential crime. And so the first thing that I would say that we need to do is ask ourselves, am I committing this profound ethical violation? We only live once, and so we only will be given this package of, package of gifts and experiences once. What am I saying to the universe, to God, to whatever it is I believe in? I'm throwing that away because I'm afraid. If I am telling the universe itself, I know more about what I have to offer than you universe itself does, what hubris is that? So that's the first thing. Are you aligning <laughs> with the, and it's a big thing, but it's yeah. a big, it's a, it's a big thing that doesn't require a lot of physical effort. You can do it in your bathtub at night. Essential. I will argue. Well, I'll tell you, what if people don't know that they're like what those gifts are? If they're, you know, how do you how do you personally define it? Is it um, you know, something that just comes easy and naturally to folks? Uh like what do you think like how do you define the a gift? I would define a gift as the dispositional characteristics that we have or the things that are our, our natural talents or are the skills or the things that we're most adept at. So for instance, I have been told, you can tell me I'm lying, and I, but I don't think I'm delusional. But one of my gifts is the ability to project my voice across the room with force. I rarely need microphones. If I am in a room, raise my voice and talk, people listen. That's a gift. It's a it's something that was a characteristic that I that I was given that I don't have anyone to I I can't feel proud about because it was given to me by nature. Right. Well, by the way, you would have crushed it on tall ships because as you're sailing and you're in the middle of storms and stuff you have to essentially project because the wind carries your voice away. Wow. So people that aren't really strong willed and like speak from the diaphragm and shout out commands and stuff, no one ever hears them and no communication ever happens. So you would have, you would have thrived on there, man. <laughs> it sounds like it would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> and but, so, okay. Yeah. So that's, so, so the gift is essentially your, you know, things that you were inherently given your natural abilities. Cause I think a lot of people, they, they see that they're good at a lot of things, mm -hmm. but they don't, if they were to just pursue one of them and, and say that it was like the ability to have this, this projection of a voice, right. And to use that to their greatest ability, they'd feel apprehensive that um, they weren't sure if that was a gift or honestly, they were just, they were just pursuing something that maybe they got good at over the years. Yeah, I think that a couple of responses I would have to that. Number one, um, I'm seriously, take some time or talk to any of the number of different coaches or other sort of self-assess self-assessment um, vehicles that are out there to get a handle on whether that is really a gift or something that you just got good at. If you if it feels natural and you like it, it's probably you know, not something that you just got good at. Like I became good at analyzing laws and making risk assessment analyses. I was good at, but I hated it. So yeah. that was not a natural <laughs> gift. It was yeah. something I just got good at. Yeah. Then the other thing that I would say to that is how are people responding to you around you? You know, an interesting thing that a life coach that I worked with um, previously suggested that I do is go to five or six people that you trust in your life who've known you for a long time and ask them the things about you that are um, that they that ask them, how do I present in the world and just start documenting that stuff. And this, as this coach told me, people will begin to say the same things. And it was true. There were five things that everyone said about me. And that to me was evidence that it was really something that was within me because of, and, and it matched my own self-perception of my gifts. And so it, right, were you like, pleased it, with it? Were you pleased with what it was said or did it catch you by surprise? And you're like, oh man, I never really thought about myself that way. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I bet what happened with me would happen with a lot of people, which is that I was surprised, but pleasantly so. Every single person, for instance, said 
I've always felt, you know, because I'm involved in Toastmasters, I do a lot of speaking, I always have, that I have the ability to be charismatic. Every single person said you're charismatic. Maybe everyone in the whole world, right? Like sometimes everyone in the whole world isn't wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, it's, and, and sometimes, and, and we have the ability to forget that. I mean, I forget sometimes the kind of stuff that just seems to come naturally. And in fact, not only do I forget about it, but I also forget how, um, you know, how, how some other people have to work so hard at doing things that come easier to me and vice versa. Right. I forget about that. And, uh, and not a yeah. good thing. And some of these things are things that might at least initially seem a little bit intangible, but have real value that can be leveraged. You know, I was talking to someone recently who is a, who's has a profound empathy. And when you meet this woman within two seconds, everyone can sense how huge her heart is. And so she might be a little bit modest and say, oh, oh me, you know, I have a big heart. Oh, I, I, da, 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 da. But everyone who meets her says it, everyone isn't wrong. She really does have a big heart. That's a huge strength that one should consider when we're looking at our these set of characteristics that we merge with our experiences to help drive us to our purpose because um, that's that's significant. Even if there might not be some sort of GDP value assigned to it, it still is of consequence. Well, once you identify some of these things that, that you're good at and you, you get some of your gifts... What's the what's the next thing? Is it a situation where like because what if your what if your gift is uh, is I don't know like I'm trying to think of something incredibly like almost useless uh, you know you find that it really comes easy that you can count count beer coasters like in a split second or some you know something like that uh, there's like another part to this there's like a utility part that that I think. Because you might you might be really good at something, but it provides you no fulfillment in in doing it. I think the fulfillment comes from the way that other people respond to it. I don't know. What do you think? I think that it's important not to break it to think about it as as the gift, as a again a, a broad characteristic of who you are as a human being, rather than something very specific. So, for instance. I the actually you provided an excellent example earlier. I might feel that my gift is the ability to stand at the top of the ship and yell at the top of my lungs during a windstorm. But you know, let's say it's sometime in the future and these things called storms in the oceans don't occur anymore. It's a sci-fi world that will never exist. And so, yes, that gift would not have any any utility. But that being said, that's because I'm defining the gift inappropriately. The gift is the voice. We have voices and we use them because they serve a function in the world. So pull back then, it would be up to me to pull back and say, okay, my gift is my voice. You know, I was told a lot of times that a good thing for me would be to be a voiceover actor. And so I took a voiceover acting course and it was interesting, the agent that ran the course, um, there was, it was a beginner course and he said, would you please never come back and take a course with us again? This is just really not right for you. Right. It, really? Why? Yeah. Why did they say that? You know, I, I didn't really get in about that, but I think that at the end of the day, it's probably because I, although I have, might have a voice that's distinctive or all of that sort of, I'm not a good actor. I'm not a good, right. I, and I wasn't able to move my, my voice into a number of different personalities that weren't me the way a lot of the actors that were in that group did. And so, yeah. right. But if I had narrow cast my gift that way as voice over acting, yeah, then I'm going to have some problems, but what are, the, what's the big picture here? Not just the gift as applied. What is the gift foundationally? We all have, we, if we, if we were only given characteristics that had no utility, our species would not have lasted very long. We're thriving on this planet, irrespective of our own self-destructive tendencies. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're right. And, and, uh, it is, it, it does. It sounds like the context, right. Really defines it. Like you can, you can redefine a skill or a talent that you have and apply it in all kinds of different, amazing, interesting, new novel ways. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, someone I know, another lawyer who is a, a wonderful author and a very smart man has a unique gift at getting to know people and, and building connections with them and getting them to like him. So he started a, you know, business networking group that's now grown and, and exploded, right? So even the ability to just make friends, that's a gift that does have potential to monetize and have with people in my garage. Yeah, you can. If you view the gift as something broadly applicable. That's why you were given the gift so it could be applied, not you weren't given an application for you to figure out a gift to wrap itself around. That's not the way the world works. Yeah, nope, all right, it makes sense. Well, I tell you what, if that is indeed the case, I love to ask this follow-up question because it really reveals, you know, I, I think that there's some people out there listening right now that are saying to themselves, just like Mary there, uh, Great, now I, I, now I have to find the gift, right? Now I have to figure out what that is. So as people go into themselves and they start to, they start to let's say they do the exercise where they ask people, what are the five things, so you the first five words that come to your mind when you think about me? Um, they do that consistently, right? If they were to do that consistently, and let's say they did that exercise to one person a day for the next 30 days. Mm -hmm. And then they looked for patterns in that. What then do they do? Let's say they find a pattern, just like you did, where you know, charis like charisma. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have it's very apparent that people see you as a charismatic guy. What then do you do with that information? Yeah. So I would say there's a couple of answers to that. First of all, then begin to begin to look at your experiences. What have they allowed you to bring to the table? Um, I had a very challenging work history, um, particularly working in government. But even in the nonprofit sector, there were a lot of challenges that I faced. In government, a lot of them were um, related to managerial experiences. I had expectations that people might have had of, of me that were not realistic or that were based on stereotypes that may not have been, uh, you know, appropriate, um, or may have just also been because of the series of bosses that I had. Th those struggles, I spent a long time feeling very, and, and then there were personal struggles as well that we all have, and I've had my share, I'm sure you have too. Um, I spent a long time wondering why, why am I having to endure this over and over? Like, why is every boss that I'm working for in government crazier than the last, right? I had a boss once who told me, um, you know, Scott, when you talk, you sound so stupid. You should put a gun to your mouth and just pull the trigger. And she said that in front of my staff and in front of my coworkers. Like I, I would ask, why am I having to have this happen to me? And it wasn't until I really began to understand my gifts and sit back and think about these experiences that I was able to begin to draw meaning from them. And then over time, those, those gifts, those experiences, I'm sorry, and the meaning that I draw from them or that I drew from them began to pull me in a direction. I will say that pulling the, the finding that direction, the mindset shift that occurred to me that really enabled that to happen was an understanding that the gifts and experience were given to us for the purpose, by the way, of service, not for gain. And once we think of then how can we take these gifts and, experience and experiences and service the world, everything will change. The other thing that I want to say is also to just understand that there is a process to this and that we have to be patient with that process. It's not going to happen in our time frame. It's not going to happen instantly or when we want. And sometimes as much as we may want to be in a situation where we're ultimately fulfilling this, you know, we're on this providential river going to this amazing destiny, that part of what the process we may need to experience is being in the situation that we're in until we can financially afford 
to make these changes or until, you know, our children are a certain age and that maybe they're away at college or until our, our student loan debt is paid off or any number of other circumstances that may keep us stuck. There are still things to learn from those. Are, those are still part of the package experiences that we want to marry. And so those are, I think that that would probably be the best way that I would answer that question. Don't be impatient. Understand that the process is there. And as you are going through the process, you're building into your bank of experience that allows you to fulfill that ultimate destiny more, number one. And then number two, um, understand that the um, that service is really, in my opinion, what's going to get you there. Once I began to understand that the gifts and experiences I had could be of service to others, people's experiences literally, um, they just seemed to attract themselves to me or I, I attracted them to me for a whole number of reasons, physiological, spiritual. I'm, there could be a number of different explanations for that, but it's, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. No, it like, uh, because you're not doing something with an ulterior motive, you're doing it out of out of a pure sense of service and people are attracted to that. You know, they, they, it, it just gives off a different vibration, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have yet to meet a lot of people that say, Oh God, he's selfish. He only looks out for himself. Let me hang out <laughs> with him. Yeah, really? My best friend, he's selfish and thinks I'm nothing. That's why I like him. There aren't a lot so of people good. like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people do that, but they think that they think that it's, because they're smart or because they're gifted or talented in some way that they can treat people like that. Mm. And, you know, and that folks will overlook their personality traits because they want to learn something from them. And that just blows my mind. Oh my that, God. Uh, well, I'll tell you, is that, tell me a little bit about how you made the switch. Cause, cause you did this screen printing, I this did. screen printing company <clears throat> and, and did it have anything to do? Like, did you see a vision, um, especially as we're talking about like gifts and service. I mean, what, how did you make this so successful? So I think a couple of things happen. Number one, in terms of making the switch itself, you know, um, I was going to a martial arts school. I only went there by the way, because someone that I knew who owned the schools pressured me over and over to go. And it was in Brooklyn. I live in the you know, Upper West Side of Manhattan. He kept saying, come train, come train. I was like, you're in Brooklyn. It's too far away. I'm not a martial artist. I don't want to be doing that. You can come like, work out of my gym with me. It's like Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something Yes, like that. exactly. Yeah. And so, but eventually I broke down, confronted my fears and went. I was... <clears throat> a uh, not so good student because my natural abilities as opposed to things I just learn <laughs> are not in the realm of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but I met some amazing people there. And one of them was a man who had just started a silk screen printing company. He knew he was a good silk screen printer, but he didn't have the business or organizational background to really set it up to succeed. And so, you know, we would headlock, he would headlock my sorry excuse for Mark <laughs> artist day after day. And then we worked on projects together together for a couple of years to sort of um, set that, re build a legitimate corporate infrastructure for that company and, and begin to think about it strategically as opposed to just, oh, let's go to the taqueria down the street and see if they want some t-shirts sort of approach to business building. And I will never forget one day after an hour of him kicking my ass on that mat. Afterwards, I, I told him, you know, we're having so much fun together. Why don't we consider um, more, a more deep and permanent engagement? He said, dude, I'm ready to get into bed right now. And so, you know, within a couple of weeks, we'd signed our papers and I had to let the nonprofit that I, the job that I had at the nonprofit, I walked in there shortly afterwards. I told the CEO I'd be leaving. He asked why and what I'd be doing. And his first response was exactly the sort of thing that you might, ex based on your comments earlier, people might respond to. He said, Scott, you're taking a big risk there. You're a friggin' yeah. He's like, well, that is crazy. And I was like, hell yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm charged. I'm char charged. And it worked, you know, it worked until it didn't work, but it worked for a long time. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. And I would not take it back for the world. For the That's world. The, the, what did you end up doing? Like, uh, did you, did you end up with this business? Were you, which, which part of it were you, were you out there like uh, getting people interested in, and creating designs? Like what, what were you doing? Yeah. So we quickly figured out my skills were not in assisting with or supervising production itself. And God knows my skills were not related to anything related to graphic design. 
And <laughs> so I was pulled away from that through my own voluntary admission of guilt <laughs> and my part, my business partners and firm insistence. Um, but I really was good with a lot of the business running things. Like I understood the finance. I understood putting in systems in place. I was organized and logical in my thinking. And I was great at going out there and networking and meeting people and our client roster and setting systems in place so that sales and the atmosphere that were related to the um, company were were terrific. And so, you know, we really went from doing work for, the, you know, the local um martial arts dojos or local businesses to doing projects for some of the largest companies in the world. I mean, we did like gay pride came to us for its, the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, right? We had major art museums doing work with us and the artists that we worked with there would stick with us. We did projects for Kickstarter, for Google, for entities like that, that are really whole foods that are massive, major branding and design companies would work with us for names that all of us, all of us know every day. Yeah. No, it was very effective. Well, um, and I would imagine because those guys really can go anywhere for screen printing yeah. services, but they chose you because you're just good people. You're, you're fun to work with, you know, and you, and you're responsible. Like, well, I, one of our d differentiators was professionalism. I mean, in this space, there were a lot of people that were just hardcore, like old school 1980s, manufacturing guys, or they were these cool art people. We had a combination of business and art and production skill in house there. And so people would say, oh, the level of professionalism. We had our own like t-shirt manufacturers or, or sweatshirt manufacturers that would refer clients to us. Oh, because th they're pros. They'll actually, yeah. your experience there will be professional. We understood that there was a continuity of care that the clients needed to have between the initial contact point and the completion of production and QA all along. And that this was all interrelated and part of the same thing. And it, and it paid off. We expanded into another city. Um, we tripled our staff size. I mean, it was it was a wonderful experience, but we ultimately had different visions for the company going forward. And we also grew very, very fast, which presented some challenges um, for my business partner in particular, because he, that was not uh, how he wanted to live his life. And did you guys did you guys talk about that when you first like signed papers, kind of like, where do we want this to be in five years? Great. Yes. And we spent a lot of time dreaming and fantasizing. And when I was in the Goldman Sachs program, even planning together what that is. And we put together a hundred page growth plan um, that we planned on executing. But, you know, when the expansion in particular to the other city occurred, it, it, you know, we have to be realistic as business people. What do we really want? I'm someone who will happily, and it, my husband doesn't like it, but I'm. The, he will acknowledge he knows who he's with at this point. <laughs> I, I will happily work 100, 120 hours a week on something if it's growing, if it's scaling, if it's becoming something big. Because I'm the sort of I'm guy who's like, go big, go up. Don't just be a twinkling little star, be a supernova. Well, just like you were saying at the very beginning, like being on the front lines of that change, like, you know, having an idea and producing and executing and like, materializing that change in the world for a good purpose. Absolutely. You know, and I would, for instance, we had met through jujitsu. Um, I dropped jujitsu, you know, there were a number of reasons why, but it was easy to let it go because the vision for the company was what ultimately was my driver. For my business partner, for instance, jujitsu, doing that all you know, a lot was something that really meant a lot to him. Having a person, his weekends free to hang out with his friends or to play, you know, video games or whatever he wanted to do. Those things mattered to him a lot more than they did to me. And so when you have different and, and planning and strategizing and dreaming about a future is different than living it. And sometimes yeah. living through something changes your mind about that. You hear about these celebrities that become celebrities and they don't, they realize they didn't want that all along. And so on a much smaller scale, you know, I think my business partner realized, oh, it was fun dreaming and planning about being Bruce Springsteen, but it's different than actually living Bruce Springsteen's life. Exactly. I like the idea of it. You know, yeah. the idea sounds amazing, <laughs> but the actual reality is, you know, and, but that, I, I love how this conversation between us has gone full circle here because at the beginning of the show, we were talking about like th giving yourself permission to experience something and to change, 
right? Yeah. And letting yourself be redefined, right? And not thinking that it's such a bad thing that you have to go and figure out a new step because you have that inner confidence. And that sounds like exactly what you did. Yeah. And I also applaud him, by the way, for being honest about it at the end. It was a process getting there, but he also was just like, you know, I have a, I have a different vision for this and, and, and we can't be together. And I, and I, of course, immediately agreed. Um, but right. He could have tried to hold on to something and, and not been honest with who and what he was and what his vision for his life was and adjusting it accordingly and been miserable. And we could have had all sorts of fights and the company could have gone down for it. Good for him. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You guys were upfront and honest about the whole thing and, and yeah. then if it just diverges, then it diverges, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and by the way, so uh, so I would imagine, I, I think, so it says, oh, my two favorite people, I'm cheating on my Zoom meeting to watch you. <laughs> I think, I think that might be Adrian. But I have I'm, a feeling. I'm, I was just thinking. <laughs> take, take a guess on that one. Uh, so, uh, dude, this has been so good. I mean, we started out talking about finding a higher purpose and that has utility in the world, but we also spent a lot of time about how it's just important to, to experience something and be okay with changing and adapting. Yeah. I mean, that's the name of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got to say, right. Like what makes these conversations great is the, what the person who is driving the conversation brings to it. So yeah, I'm talking about you there. <laughs> well, thank you, man. Uh, I really appreciate it. I, uh, yeah. I, you know, it like you do a ton of shows. Uh, yeah. and, and so I know you can appreciate this. Like, the idea of learning something new, the, the fear was really real. At the very beginning of these shows, this is 115, and like at the very, very beginning, had no idea what I was doing at all. And you say to yourself, like, I'm going to suck, but that's okay because I'm going to learn every yeah. single day and get better and better. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, right, and going through that. And you know what, by the way, I wasn't always a horrible bru bru uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner <laughs> over time. With a lot of practice and humiliation, I actually ended up, I will never say that I was great. You still, you ended still up do it? Competent. Unfortunately, I don't. And, and certainly no way it's happening during this pandemic and all these shutdowns right now. Yeah. But it changed my life forever. And I would recommend it to anyone who is interested in personal development because it's a profound metaphor. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it is. Uh, I'll tell you, man, Scott, this has been so good. If Josh, you are if, you. If people people want to continue the conversation with you, uh, tell us a little bit about what you got going on these days. Yeah, so I have my own podcast as well called Scott Mason's Purpose Highway, and it is a space for people to talk about connecting to their higher purpose to build a better self and a better world. I also do a lot of public speaking. You can find out more about me at speakerscott.com. I also run a business, a small business consultancy um, company that um, works with small business owners who want to successfully grow, scale, and sustain themselves as businesses. When I speak, I speak a lot about connecting with purpose as well as um, discussing entrepreneurialism. And I have been told that I bring power, passion, energy, and true feeling to those speeches. And um, I hope that at least a little bit of that has been conveyed today because I feel passionately about the things we've been talking about. Damn straight, man. <laughs> well, let me tell you, like uh, Perian says, this was a grand show. Grand. Right? I love it. Ab you know, you brought you brought it, dude. <laughs> you absolutely brought it. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm just, I know that you're a busy guy. You got a lot going on. Um, I encourage everybody that's listening right now to honestly check out the podcast, check out the show. Uh, where do they find you? So we put the link to uh, Speaker Scott, speakerscott.com, correct? Yep. Yeah. So we put that link in the show notes. Um, Thank you. As far as the consultancy is concerned, if people have questions about their own small businesses, I mean, you just have so much extensive experience running businesses from the back end of things, systems, Absolutely. finance, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, where can they connect with you uh, at Speaker Scott? Yeah, I mean, I do have another website, scottmasonllc.com, but ultimately speakerscott.com, um, uh, you can find me there and it's the easiest and most comprehensive website that I have. Okay, I dig it, man. Yeah. It's been so good. It, it has, has been, been a so blast. Uh, well, as we wrap up, you got any quick parting words for people that are listening right now something that you want to leave them with before we go you know connecting with purpose building a better self 
and a better world puts us in a position where all of us could end up being the heroes of an incredible journey to make this planet better. Um, I hope that by us having this blast of a conversation today, we have in our own way been heroes on our own leg of the journey and helped other folks be heroes on their own legs of the journey too, because all of us, especially with everything we've been through this year, all of us deserve to um, to have a journey that has a truly heroic end. Damn straight, my man. And it just honestly, like for everybody listening right now, because because there's people watching, but then there will also be people listening on the podcast. I think that voice actor coach or whatever, the teacher is crazy, dude. Your voice is insanely cool. <laughs> You made me very happy, my brother. Thank you. I, I feel so connected to my purpose right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, this was this was so good. Uh, honestly, everybody's loving it. So mm-hmm. I just want to say thanks again, man, for everything, for your time. Go check out Scott, speakerscott.com. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for everything, man. Thank you, Josh. You're incredible. Yes. Well, I appreciate it. So this is Josh. This is Scott. This is Elvis, the rooster running around here somewhere, um, who's been notoriously quiet this entire time. Uh, And we just want to say thanks for joining us. We stream live Monday through Saturday. That's six people per week. So there's always somebody to listen to 12 p.m. Eastern. So come join us again on some other day. And uh, Scott, thanks again for being here. My pleasure. All right. See you guys later. Adios.